This is Harsh Rules, I'm Ben Harsh, and today we're going to learn to play Commands and Colors Ancients. Commands and Colors Ancients was released in 2006 by GMT Games and designed by Richard Borg. This game supports up to two players and most scenarios can be completed in less than an hour. Before we begin this episode, I'd like to recognize the Harsh Rules Patreon supporters that help make content like this possible. If you'd like to support the channel, head over to patreon.com slash harsh rules to learn more. And once again, thank you for your support. Welcome back to the Harsh Rules Breakdown for Commands and Colors Ancients. In this episode, we're going to cover the game's various rules for terrain. There's a lot to discuss, so let's get started. Commands and Colors Ancient's first mission does not have terrain tiles which allows new players to become acclimated with the core rules. Subsequent missions, however, use a variety of terrain to represent historical landmarks and add an additional layer of strategy to the game. This includes new rules for moving into specific terrain types, line of sight restrictions, and combat modifiers. Next, we're going to look at each of these terrain types in greater detail. Let's begin learning about terrain with broken ground. For movement, there are no restrictions for foot units except war machine units, which may not enter a broken ground hex. Any mounted unit or unattached leader must stop when it enters a broken ground hex and move no further on that turn. A mounted unit may not battle on the turn it enters a broken ground hex. And if a mounted unit entered broken ground on a momentum advance, it may not bonus close combat. All units that battle into or out of broken ground roll a maximum of two battle dice. However, a command card that adds additional dice in battle will modify this maximum. Finally, a broken ground hex does not block line of sight. Next, let's discuss forest terrain. For movement, all units and leaders must stop when entering a forest hex and may move no further on that turn. They also may not battle that turn with the following unit exceptions. Light infantry, light sling infantry, light bow infantry, auxilia infantry, and warrior infantry. These units may move onto a forest hex and still battle. These are also the only units which can momentum advance into a forest hex and have the potential for a bonus close combat. Other units which momentum advance into a forest hex may not conduct a bonus close combat. All close combat involving a forest hex, whether attacking into or defending from, will roll a maximum of two battle dice. A unit attacking into a forest hex with ranged combat will roll a maximum of one die. However, a command card that adds additional dice in battle will modify both of these maximums. Finally, a forest hex blocks line of sight. Next, let's discuss terrain hexes with hills. With hills, there are no movement restrictions. When units attack into a hill hex with close combat, they are attacking uphill and roll a maximum of two battle dice. When battling an enemy unit that is downhill, or when battling from one hill hex to another hill hex, foot units roll a maximum of three battle dice, mounted units roll a maximum of two battle dice. Finally, a hill hex blocks line of sight to units behind it. A unit on a lower level has line of sight onto the first hill hex and vice versa. However, a unit on a lower level does not have line of sight through one hill hex onto a second hill hex with a unit and vice versa. In other words, a unit at a lower level is not able to see or be seen if at least one other hill hex is between the two units. Line of sight is not blocked between units that are both on hills because they are at the same level. A seacoast hex is impassable terrain. Moving, retreating, evading, or escaping onto a seacoast hex is not allowed. 
Therefore, battle is not applicable, and a Secos hex does not block line of sight. A quick note, Secos hexes may also be used to denote the shore of a lake, with the same effects in the game. Much like seacoast hexes, river hexes are also treated as impassable terrain. However, there are some scenarios that have fordable rivers. With a fordable river hex, all units and leaders must stop when entering and may move no further on that turn. For battles, a unit may battle in the turn it enters a fordable river hex. When battling an enemy unit on a fordable river hex, or a unit on a fordable river hex battling out, both units will roll a maximum of two battle dice. A unit that battles with ranged combat out of a river will roll a maximum of one battle die. A command card that adds additional dice in battle will modify the maximum number of battle dice allowed. After a successful close combat, a unit on a fordable river hex may make a momentum advance out of that hex. Also, a fordable river hex does not block line of sight. Some river hexes may have bridges spanning them. This terrain hex is also used if the scenario calls for a pontoon. If a river hex has a bridge in place, there are no movement restrictions. And a unit may battle on the turn it enters a bridge hex. When attacking into a bridge hex, a maximum of two battle dice are rolled in close combat. Range combat is unaffected. A unit defending out from a bridge hex will roll a maximum of two battle dice in close combat or one battle die in range combat. A unit on a bridge hex may still make a momentum advance after a successful close combat. A foot unit defending on a bridge hex may also ignore one flag rolled against it. And a command card that adds additional dice in battle will modify these maximums. Finally, a bridge hex does not block line of sight. Rampart terrain is used to indicate a number of different wall types. Let's begin with the basic rampart wall type. With ramparts, there are no movement restrictions. Battling into or out of or defending from ramparts is dependent on which side of the hex has the wall. When defending from attackers across a wall in close combat, units can ignore one sword die result and one flag die result. When receiving ranged combat across a wall hex side, a unit can ignore one flag. Finally, a rampart does not block line of sight. Now, let's discuss scalable city walls. Remember, these use the same rampart terrain hexes, but the rules are very different. To move onto a scalable city wall hex, a foot unit or leader must start its move from a hex adjacent to the wall. Once on the scalable city wall hex, they must stop and may move no further on that turn. And if they move off the wall, the same rules apply. They must stop and can move no further that turn. However, retreating or evading foot units or leaders do not have to stop when entering a scalable city wall hex. Now, also be aware that mounted units and war machines cannot enter a scalable city wall hex. This is impassable terrain for them. However, both may close combat adjacent units on scalable city wall hexes if they begin their turn adjacent to the wall. Neither type of unit, though, may retreat or evade onto a scalable city wall. Let's talk about close combat. When battling an enemy unit on a scalable city wall hex, or a unit on a scalable city wall hex battling out, the units roll a maximum of two battle dice. Any unit defending on a scalable city wall hex disregards one sword symbol and one flag symbol rolled against it when attacked from any adjacent hex. Okay, the next rule is a really tricky one. A defending unit on a scalable city wall hex that cannot evade or elects not to evade will battle first when being attacked in close combat unless the attacking enemy unit is also on an adjacent scalable city wall hex. Treat the defending unit as if it possesses a first strike card and treat the combat as a first strike combat. 
Okay, let's talk about range combat. A unit defending on a scalable city wall hex may disregard one flag rolled against it. However, adjacent enemy units prevent range combat. Standard line of sight rules apply to determine this. Also, a command card or leader that adds additional dice in battle will modify the maximums here. Finally, a scalable city wall hex blocks line of sight to units behind it, and vice versa. Line of sight is not blocked between units on the same scalable city wall. This means they're all at the same level. Alright, we're not done yet. Let's talk about fortified city walls. Fortified city walls are normally considered impassable terrain for all units unless siege rules are in effect. These will be noted in the scenario special rules. When siege rules are in effect, the attacking foot units have scaling ladders and fortified city walls are treated as scalable walls. With fortified city walls, no battle is possible unless those siege rules are in effect. And, a fortified city wall blocks line of sight to units behind it, and vice versa. Next, let's look at the fortified camp hex. There are no movement restrictions for entering a fortified camp hex. In battles with close combat, a unit defending on a fortified camp hex disregards one sword symbol and may disregard one flag rolled against it. In ranged combat, a unit defending on a fortified camp hex may disregard one flag rolled against it. Please note, mounted units receive no protective benefit from fortified camp hexes. Also, a fortified camp hex offers this protection against attacks from all sides. Be aware though, a unit on a fortified camp hex rolls one fewer battle dice than usual when it battles. This applies to close combat and ranged fire. Also note, a command card that adds additional dice in battle will modify the number of battle dice maximum that can be rolled. And finally, a fortified camp blocks line of sight. Now, let's discuss one of the most unique terrain hexes in the game, the Marsh. For movement, a unit or unattached leader must stop when it moves onto a marsh hex and move no further on that turn. The unit or unattached leader must also roll one battle die for a possible block loss. One unit block is lost when the unit symbol is rolled. A leader is eliminated when a leader symbol is rolled. Retreating or evading units or leaders do not have to stop when entering a marsh hex. A unit or leader that must retreat or evades onto or through a marsh hex must still check for a possible block loss for each marsh hex it retreats or evades onto or through. Marsh block loss die rolls are made prior to removing unit blocks for unfulfilled map edge hex retreats. A unit or leader that leaves a marsh hex may only move onto an adjacent hex regardless of its normal movement allowance. Please note, a War Machine unit may not move, evade, or retreat onto a Marsh Hex. For combat, a unit may battle the turn it moves onto a Marsh Hex. When battling an enemy unit on a Marsh Hex, a maximum of two battle dice are rolled in close combat. A unit that elects to advance onto a Marsh Hex after a successful close combat must check for a possible block loss. A unit on a marsh hex battling out will roll a maximum of two battle dice in close combat and one die in range combat. A unit on a marsh hex that has not already moved this turn may make a momentum advance out of the marsh hex onto the vacated hex after a successful close combat, but cavalry units may, may not make a special momentum advance. Finally, marsh hexes do not block line of sight. Hopefully, this walkthrough of Command and Colors Ancients Terrain will give you a better idea of how to navigate later scenarios. Keep these rules in mind because in the next episode, we're going to be looking at more advanced rules for this game. If you found this video helpful, please give me a like and share with your friends. To be the first notified when the next episode of Harsh Rules becomes available, please hit the bell icon for notifications. And as always, this is Ben Harsh for Harsh Rules. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you on the next video.